Good morning to all of you out there, those of you that are viewing us live, those of you that are in the house today, welcome back to the house once again. How many of you are glad to be here? Amen, amen. Well, it's my pleasure to bring the word unto you today. Um, I'm Pastor Milton, bringing you the word of God on behalf of Apostles Chastine and Ella Rock. Uh, wonderful apostolic overseers. And so today we have a wonderful word from the Lord uh, to bring to you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to uh, provide insight, wisdom, revelation, so that you may continue to walk in and possess everything that God has already done for you. He's done it for you. He's done it for me. And you know, the thing is that it does not matter the times that you and I live in. We know that we live in some very uh, interesting times, <laughs> to say the very least. The times are very interesting as to what is going on around us in the world, and, you know, uh, very unique times. And all of the things that we have learned over the years up to this point in your life, all of these things have been preparing us for the days that we're in right now and the days that are ahead. And so all of the lessons that we have learned about walking by faith and trusting God, all of these things come to play right now, do they not? So, you know, there are many different things that are going on in the world around us, many different uh, uh, calamities, a lot of different things that we hear about, confusion about wear the mask, don't wear the mask, get this shot, don't get the shot. You know, a lot of different things are going on one thing always will remain the same, and that is God is. God is. God is. <laughs> Some of you are going to get that. <laughs> God is. And so the Bible says this, he that comes to God must believe that he what? Not that he was. You know, not that his strength expired on yesterday like your wonder bread. You know? Not like that 2% that milk in your refrigerator, but he is. He always is. And the Bible says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I pray that that is you and you out there that in spite of whatever is going on and the question marks that are in our society, there is one thing that is always the answer. One place that we can always go to to find the answer and that is in the Word of God. The Bible tells us that there's nothing new under the sun, that what we have seen going on, that, you know, it has occurred before, just maybe in different levels, different aspects of it, but the same God who sits on the throne, the same one that said light be, is the same one that is. And he's here today to help you, to meet you where you are, to comfort you, to strengthen you, to provide for you, to encourage you in all of the aspects of life where sometimes we might get discouraged, you know? So today we're going to bring a uh, wonderful word of God to continue to strengthen you and to help you to know who you are in Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you all to join me in a word of prayer. Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we come before you today and we honor you and we bless your name. We thank you for this opportunity and this time to uh, sit at your feet to hear your word. Things that you prepared to say to us today that you had carved out for this specific day, August the 1st, 2021. Thank you for your word that is going forth in this house and in all of your places of worship all around the world. Thank you, Father, for the, the wisdom and the revelation of your word that comes. Whereas even our Lord Jesus stated that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because of what he reveals, the insight, the strategies and the tactics that you reveal to us in the present time that we live in. And so we thank you for the opportunity to learn and to grow, to walk in greater levels and dimensions of victory, to advance your kingdom here in the earth. And so we thank you, Father, that our hearts are receptive and our minds are alert and attentive to hear what you're saying today. Thank you for clarity and the truth of your word that will go forth on good ground. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty. 
Well, two weeks ago, I came to you guys with a message on beginning to talk about priesthood. And um, today we're going to continue in this, and I want to provide some uh, more clarity in regards to priesthood. You know, sometimes when we think about the term priest in the church, um, I, I think most people's minds go to uh, the Catholic denomination where they think about the priests, you know, and as they, they quote unquote say his holiness, you know, and all of those things, you know. And, and there are certain things that have gained a uh, traditional aspect in the church over the history of the church and so on. But I want to provide further clarity today on what it means to be a king and a priest of the Lord. And so we're going to talk about this today in further light. A couple of weeks ago, I came to you talking about the priesthood, and you can go back and get the message. You can go to our site and view the uh, previous message on this. But the last time we talked about priesthood being the system of access and delivery, and we talked about the access that God gives us now by being priests, and that we have the ability to go to him to access uh, greater dimensions or realities of the power of God that can be present in our lives in this three-dimensional world that we live in, there is another dimension that God has given us to be able to go to. And Jesus went there often, and he is the, the pattern son to teach us and to show us the way of how to access and how to gain a, a, a place of that dimension that supersedes that is able to change the realities that go on in this three-dimensional world that you and I live in, okay? And so we're going to get into this a little bit further just to provide some greater clarity because um, many people do think, when, you said, when I said the word priest, I, I, I was picking up on a little bit of, of confusion from some people as to priest being and the office in the church as far as the fivefold ministry, and that's not what I'm referring to. The priest is a position of every believer, every blood-bought, blood-washed believer. God has made us kings and priests, okay? And so we're going to look at some scriptures that back this up today and, um, and to provide some further clarity on the priesthood. So today we're going to talk about priesthood again, but today we're going to be talking about the responsibility of the believer. So you can write this down as today's subject matter, priesthood, the responsibility of the believer. Now, Winston Churchill has gone on to be quoted to say that the price of greatness is what? Oh, I thought some of you guys knew that one. Okay, the price of greatness is responsibility. And so uh, you can look that up on Google, Winston Churchill quotes and so on, and you'll see that one there. But... He was a, a Christian young man, and, but he, he made this statement that people quoted, the price of greatness, if you want to be great, start being responsible. Be responsible for the things that are around you, personally in your life, and then allow that to grow from there, okay? So the price of greatness is responsibility. How many of you know you shouldn't be looking at your neighbor to be responsible when you yourself have not been responsible? Okay, so as Jesus said, get the beam out of your own eye before you try to get the splinter out of your neighbor's eye, you know. And so God wants all of us to be responsible, and he created us to be responsible. When we look at all of the vast amount of things that are going on in the world around us, in our nation, around the globe, okay, sometimes in your family, sometimes in your very own home, there is a level of of responsibility that God has given to all of us. Responsibility, accountability, these are the words that sometimes we try to shy away from, you know, but these are very important words in the life of the believer. And so let's look at some things about priesthood. I want to talk about the history of priesthood a little bit just to give you some biblical background on the importance of priesthood and how it has been there all along and what God expects of us as priests, and this is so vitally important when you understand, um, <clears throat> understand priesthood. So looking back at priesthood, Adam was ordained as the first king priest of the earth to represent God and to serve him on the earth, okay? 
So Adam was. How do we know that? Okay. Well, one, God gave Adam dominion. And he made him responsible for everything that is on the earth. He said, have dominion, subdue it. If that means if anything tries to take your place of authority, this is why we are the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. We are in the place of preeminence as far as what God positioned us in the earth. Over all of everything else that is in creation on the earth, God put us in the place of first. He's first, obviously, okay? But in the position of rank, authority, dominion, God put man first. Everything else falls under the category of man. And this is why the Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, it says, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over everything that creeps on the earth, all the creeps, okay? Uh, everything that creeps. That means that we are, we have authority, but we also have responsibility to make sure that everything that is on the earth aligns itself with how God establishes his dominion, his domain, and his authority. So if we find something that is not in accordance with how God does things, then we ought to deal with it, okay? So God put man in a position to do that and to be that. And this is what the priesthood does. It presents creation, everything that God created, it presents it to God, and then it also presents God to it. And this is what we have as part of our responsibility as priests and as kings exercising that dominion. So Adam demonstrated, and he was given the responsibility as the first king priest. And we're going to look at some examples and see um, how this was as well to further cement this. So God gave him dominion over everything, and he was responsible for the earth, just like you and I, okay? We have in the Old Testament where um, the, the, the anointing of God came on three people primarily, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And so we have an example of, of, of dominion and how God dealt with men during those days and so forth, and he still deals with us in certain ways. But God put man, or he put certain um, positions or established certain things so that we would be responsible for the things that go on in the earth. So in other words, when we find that things are going on around us that aren't right, somewhere along the way, whether it was something that we were directly responsible for or if historically, collectively, we were responsible for, somewhere along the line, somebody got out of place and it allowed access to something else to come in there to usurp the authority that God gave to man. You, you understand? And so this is why even in, um, if, as you've heard it taught here uh, years past, that even... Um, every uh, man in their household is a prophet, the priest, and the king in your home. We have a responsibility to make sure that what goes on in your home, it lines up with what the word of God says. Can I get some men out there to say amen? amen. All right. <laughs> and so we have a responsibility. So priesthood is a position. It is a position that God has established for the believer and not just for uh, the fivefold ministry gifts. Okay, we all are part of that. If you are a believer of Jesus Christ, if you have gotten born again, if you have been washed by the blood of Jesus, God has made all of us kings and priests to serve him. Okay, so it says that it goes on to say, well, Adam failed in his priesthood. Okay, we all are aware of that. So instead of every man being born into uh, God's kingdom as a king priest, the priesthood was handed down, okay? So this is what happened uh, biblically, historically, biblically over the course of time. So I'm just giving you some background to help you understand some things that we'll talk about. So it started with Adam. God made him responsible. God, uh, Adam dropped the, the ball on that, okay? Um, so then what happened is that God began to um, help man to get back to a place of of, of, of offering up sacrifices and things of that nature so that the connection that had been broken, so now that there was something that would cover that, okay, cover that severed connection, 
and reestablish their relationship back with God through man, with man. And so there were sacrifices and, so th and things of that nature that God taught man and, and raising up the altars and presenting those things before God. And so the, it, historically what happened is God began to say this, that the firstborn son was to be taught those things as far as priesthood was concerned, all right? Then we pick up in Numbers uh, chapter, let's see, where is it? Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 3. When the children of Israel, when God had led the children of Israel out of um, Egypt, he began to now say, he began to establish the priesthood through the Levites, through the, uh, the house of Aaron and so on. And he established the priesthood there where it was established. And it says in one of those verses, he says, instead of the firstborn, now this responsibility comes strictly on to the house of Levi. All right. So it went from being, and this is why when you look um, in the uh, garden, or excuse me, back with Cain and Abel, this, the account of them, um, one of the reasons why God was dealing with Cain as well was because he was the firstborn. And the responsibility of their lineage of the priesthood was going through the firstborn male, okay? Then it came on down to the Levites, so it was passed on to the house of the Levites, and then we get um, the priesthood where we see through Melchizedek. And this is the pattern of which Jesus' priesthood comes after, Melchizedek. And so now we get into the place of where Jesus has completed the work. He's the finished work, and he is the high priest of God before the throne of God. As the Bible says, he reconciled not only the things of, of the earth, but also those things that were in heaven. And so now by his blood that is presented on the altar before God, now he has made us kings and priests. Okay? So we see he's restored us back to the place of where we were in the garden before man fell, where Adam was the priest of God who presented. And this is why it talks about how the voice of God came to fellowship with Adam in the cool of the day and so on. And there were certain times where God came and, and you know, we know about the feasts and all of those things. So there were certain times where Adam had to present certain things because these were the times, the set times that God established where his sons came before him. So you guys understanding all of these things, okay? We've talked about some of this before. And so Jesus came and he brought us back to that place of now we have the ability to come before God as kings and priests, as men who live here on the earth, and he's now given us the ability to go before him to begin to exercise and to operate from another dimension, the same one that Jesus operated as a, as a son of God, a son of man on the earth, and now he's given us the ability to operate or to access that dimension to operate and to cause heaven to be on earth, to cause heaven to be in your circumstance and in the matters of our lives, okay? So I've said a whole lot, of covered a whole lot of ground trying to be, you know, short with this, okay? So let's look at some scriptures that talk about this. And you can look at Numbers chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12, and it talks about how God established the, uh, the priesthood from the firstborn male to the, the tribe of the Levites. And there were certain uh, Levites that um, were responsible for now carrying on the priesthood and so on. And that went on from generation to generation until the time of Jesus. And so um, let's look at a few scriptures here. Let's turn to uh, first, first Peter chapter 2. Let's look at this one. And those of you that have been in uh, GXP for any amount of years, you know this one. So let's look at this one really quick. So 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 5, it says this. You guys there? It says, you also as lively stones. How many of you are lively in here? That means living stones. So that means you're not some uh, cold lump of coal. You are a living stone. This is what he's saying here. That means you are a hot coal. It's like those coals that are around the, 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 the altar of God, okay? You are a hot living coal, okay? It says, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, okay? He's talking to all of us that are believers, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices 
And we talked a little bit about those spiritual sacrifices. What are they? So we don't have to offer up blood sacrifices anymore. Jesus did that once and for all. But the sacrifices that we offer up are our praise, our giving, okay? Uh, you know, for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the kingdom. Uh, you know, the things that we do that we sacrifice for the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Okay, all of those things that we see in the Bible outside of, you know, um, sacrificing lambs and all of those things. Again, we don't have to do all of that. Those things are done away with because Jesus has done it. And so but there are things that every day that we should be doing to preserve our holiness. One of the things that we looked at when the uh, uh, the armies were going around Jericho, they had the army in the front and the back of the priests. With the, the, who were carrying the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the, the presence of God, the power of God. And when they had the Ark, man, guess what? Those, those um, other armies and cities and, and you know, nations, man, they feared because they knew what was up. That was the, the power of God that was present there with them. And they knew that when they had the Ark, they had great confidence. Guess what? Because they had the presence of God. No matter what enemy came against them, and, and so one of the things that this teaches us is the importance of protecting the holiness of the presence of God in our lives every day. See, to be a priest, one of the conditions was that good character obviously had to be there, but there was a certain level of holiness. And see, sometimes we relegate those things to the fivefold ministry gifts, but when you understand that all of us, God has created all of us to be kings and priests. So instead of you just saying to a certain office in the church, your holiness, it should be that we all are our holiness. You understand what I'm saying? So when you understand this, you won't say, well, I just had to have a little sippy sippy. I had to have a little looky looky. Or I had to have a little touchy touchy. When you understand this, you don't make excuses for sin. You understand that I am, God says that I should be holy for he is, okay, for he is holy, so I be holy like he be holy. You understand? So, so we are kings and priests and God has preserved us. He has handpicked us from the batch. He has preserved us. He has plucked us out, okay? He's made us his very own unique people. This is what it says down in verse 9. We are a chosen generation, a royal. That means we are a kingly priesthood, okay? A kingly priesthood. This is who God has called us to be. So we need to look at ourselves in a different manner, understanding that I am royalty, okay? I am royalty. I am a king, and there is authority, and there is dominion that comes from the king. We're going to look at that in a moment. But we are also priests, so I have the responsibility, first of all, look at myself, look at my household, look at my family, look at the world around me. I have the responsibility to make sure that I subdue it, that I make sure that it lines up with what I see in God's word. And this is what the priest does. The priest presents God to the people or to the situation, the circumstance, the environment, okay? And it presents it's the priest is a mediator to present the people or the circumstances also before God. This is why the Bible says we approach the throne room of grace boldly so that we can receive grace and help in the time of need. So we present God to our problem and we present our problem to God and then we speak to it according to the word of God as well. Amen. All right. So. So 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, as I just pretty much uh, mentioned, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own uh, special people, that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. See, as priests, and this is where Jesus operated from, God gives us insight on how we should operate from in Genesis 1, 3, when when. We see there all of the things that were going on. It says that God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. And then it says the earth was void and without form. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, hovered on the face of the deep or the waters and so on. And then it says in verse 3, God said, and this is where all of us that are priests of God, kings 
of God. This is where Jesus operated from, and he established the pattern, okay? The first Adam dropped the ball. The second Adam picked it up and said, this is a pattern of how we should live. The Bible, and John also goes on to talk about this. It says, in him was life, and his life was the light of men. So in Genesis 1-3, God said, light be. And, and science proves that there is no measure on where that light is even right now today. And so everything that God wants us to operate from and to speak from should be from that place of light. This is why the Bible says that we should walk in the light as he is in the light. God is light, okay, and he has no darkness. And so as a priest, and this is what Jesus operated in, he went to that place, and this is why he went there to pray. As you see oftentimes, even though he was God in the flesh, he prayed. He went before God. He went to that place of where there was only light, and he came back from that place, and then he operated from that place every day in his life and in his ministry. And so we see that there is a place that God has called us from, and he's called us to operate in. That is the only way that we're going to overcome the darkness that has gotten very thick on the earth right now is operating from that place of light. The Bible says that God separated the light because otherwise you would succumb to the darkness. He separated the light from the darkness or the darkness from the light so that you would know that the darkness is not his best and he, that you would know that the darkness is not good. And there's so much darkness that is out on the, on the face of the earth right now. I'm not talking about uh, physically. I'm talking about spiritually. And it's impacting the physical by the actions and the fruit that we see, all of the things that we see going on. Everything, and this is why I told you, everything, okay, you see this throughout the word of God and you understand this even about our lives. Everything naturally that has taken place was first, has first taken place from the realm of the spirit, good and bad. And so God is trying to get us to change and understand how to change the world that is around us, the natural world around us, by operating from the place of the realm of the spirit. And Jesus operated from another dimension. Yes, we have the three-dimensional world and everything that we can touch, taste, feel, see everything, all of those things. But God is over and over again through the scriptures trying to get us to understand that there is a greater place that I want you to operate from. And sometimes, you know, we, you know, we don't get there because we are very naturally minded sometimes. And so Let's look at another scripture where it talks about our kingly priesthood. All right, again, Jesus established a pattern. He established the pattern of what the, the, how the first Adam should have operated in and did operate up to a certain point. And he establishes the pattern so that you and I, this is why Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. So in other words, he didn't say that you can't do these things, so don't expect. He said, greater works are you going to do, okay? So he says, I'm teaching you the pattern. I'm teaching you what you should do and what you can do, okay? This is all a part of the process of renewing our minds. It's not just, you know, replacing your cussing with, and fussing with, with scriptures, but it's understanding how God operates so that we can operate in those things in our lives, his ways that he operates in, Okay? And so um, let's look at Revelation chapter 1. In verse 6, and this is uh, Jesus talking to um, Apostle John. Oh, he's talking here. And... Uh, Let's start at verse 5. And from Jesus, who, Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and uh, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Okay? So he's talking about all of us that have been washed by the blood of Jesus. And it says, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be a glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see here, here's another account that uh, includes us in the king 
the royal priesthood that God has established through Jesus Christ. Again, God has brought us back to a place of dominion. See, it's only through lack of understanding or ignorance or, or just not accepting the truth that we, uh, that we actually um, we submit or, or I would say we yield our authority that has been given us by uh, Jesus Christ. And so, you know, there have been many um, things that have been taught us over the years that have um, hindered us from accepting and embracing who we are in Christ Jesus. See, this is a difference between hearing the word of God, you know, and, and, and having a revelation of the word of God. I've learned this even in my own life. There is a difference between me just speaking the word of God and then when the revelation comes of that word and then when I speak it, the results are different. And so that's that place of light where God wants us to operate from, where the revelation is coming. This is why Jesus said, upon that revelation, knowledge, this is why the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's not by just quoting a few scriptures and, and, and not have the meaning or the impact of it or the revelation of it within. But when you understand the, 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 the impact behind the truth that is being spoken or that was spoken to us by the word of God, then when you speak, it's the light is going to come. The light is going to be back in what you say. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so this is the major difference. And so, you know, I pray you guys, you go back and listen to these things because I know I'm covering a lot of ground in regards to this. And it's not something that you hear over and over again as often. So you have to listen to it more intently and research it a little bit more. All right, let's go to, uh, let's see, Revelation uh, chapter, I think I'm going to go to chapter 5. I'm trying to hear my notes. Give me a moment. Yes, Revelation chapter 5. And I'm going to read this one out of the Amplified. And it says this, and um, let's start in verse 8. Let me switch over here. So look at what it says. We'll begin in verse 8. It says, And when he had taken the scroll, uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, so Jesus had taken the scroll. <laughs> when he had taken the scroll and the four uh, living creatures and the 24 elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin prostrated themselves before the Lamb. Each was holding a harp, a lute or guitar, and they had golden bowls full of incest, fragrant spices and gums for burning, which are the prayers of God's people, the saints. So he's giving a, he's really giving us a picture of what goes on in heaven. Um, when we are collectively as a body of Christ, you notice he says saints. So it's saints offering up prayers, okay? Um, and so he's given us a picture of what goes on in heaven when we are doing certain things, okay? So in this aspect of things as well, prayers are being offered up. And so um, verse 9, and it says, And now they sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it. You were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased men unto God. Okay, so this is talking about you. This is talking about me, no matter what your age is. Okay, no matter what ethnicity you came from, even if you are of mixed ethnicity. Okay, it does not matter what generation you come from. It does not matter how old you are, young you are. Doesn't matter how many hairs you have on your head, how many you don't have on your head. Okay, does not matter any of those things. It, this is the only thing that matters. It says, and with your blood, you purchased men unto God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Okay? And, and this is why I've read it out of the Amplified and, 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 and the other versions of the Bible original text say it this way. And this is why I read it this way because out of the King James, it doesn't say it quite like this in verse 10. And it says, and you have made them a kingdom royal race and priest to our God. So he's talking about every person from every ethnicity, every nation, every generation who has been bought by the blood of Jesus. He has made all of us 
kings and priests. And so what that has done, it has given us access. And, and so these are some of those prayers that were being poured out out of that, the, the, um, that bowl that was before the throne. So when we go before God, God gives us access to access a greater dimension than what is going on right here. And sometimes, as you heard apostles say, we have to continue to access. Jesus said, knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking, okay? Um, and, you know, we have to continue to seek after and to continue to go before the throne of God. And as, as the word says, don't let me rest until what I said is done. And this is the thing. In um, Ecclesiastes, I think it's in Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, let's see here. What's that? Give me one second. I'm going to tell you how powerful the words of the king are and how powerful and important it is to get God's words in your mouth when you are speaking as a, as a priest and as a king. All right? So, um, let's see. Give me one second. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let's turn there real quick. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified as well. How do you overcome the circumstances and the situations that are going on in your life right now? How do you subdue those things and bring them under the authority of God's word that you see in, your, that you see in God's word? How do we change the circumstances in the environment that is in our lives? How do, in spite of the ethnic background that you come from, how do you overcome those adversities that sometimes come as a result of race? How do you establish a ministry in the midst of Fredericksburg without any previous financial backing and support from any other previous denomination or, or, or anything else? How do you establish the kingdom of God? in the earth and follow those things is through this. When God gives instruction, when God gives a word, when God gives anything that according to his purpose and what he has established, okay? It's us in agreement with that word and reciprocating or speaking back to God and speaking what God has already said. This is what begins to establish the thing that God has already said. This is why the Bible says, you know, in the mouth of every two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So when God speaks something, and then when I speak what God has already said and what he has already decreed and declared, then it's like having another witness. It's the king, and then you have a king that is declaring the same thing. And look at what the Bible says about the word of a king in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. This is out of the Amplified again. It says, for the word of a king is authority and power. Who are you again? You are a king and a priest unto God. What did God give to Adam? He gave him dominion. He gave him authority to subdue, to conquer. If anything rise up in your life that does not line up with God's word, he says, you overcome it, you conquer it in my name. He says, for the word of a king is authority. See, here's a, a principle that God is relaying to us to help us to understand the importance of your words. This is why you shouldn't be just saying any and everything as well. This is even why Jesus said that, uh, that every one of us must give account even for the idle words that we speak out of our mouths. Idle words become words that don't bear fruit. Okay, so think about this, and this is a greater understanding of this. I think that what God expects out of the words that come out of our mouths is that we speak such things that line up with what he has spoken. Okay, even as you heard apostles say that when we pray, that we speak according to even what the counsel of God says. Okay, so when God begins to counsel, you begin to go before the Lord about something or, or God counsels you on something 
even direction in your life or about, you know, for example, about the, the church and establishing this ministry. I'm just using that as an example. Something that has happened that all of us can see and that go, has gone on and is still going on, okay? So when God gives a word and when we begin to speak what God says, I believe this, that God expects the words that come out of our mouth to produce fruit, okay? That we speak just as when he stood out on the edge of, of darkness and he said, light be. Obviously, we know that he wasn't talking about the sun because that was created on day four, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all those things. So we know that he was talking about himself. He was talking about himself, okay? And that's why science is still measuring because there is no measurement on himself. You understand? And God wants us now as kings and priests to get to the place of where we speak based on what God has already spoken so that now we have not just what we're speaking and, you, you know, you, you, you're monitoring your words that you're not just speaking and, and saying any and over everything. This is why it's so dangerous when you talk about other people, when you begin to say things and, and derail and, 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 and berate people with your words, tear them down, because there is authority in the words of a king, okay? And God has made us king, saying this, and this is a thing that you have to understand. The enemy knows that as well. And if he can get you to speak words that are contrary to what God's word says, this is why it says, and, um, you know, in Numbers, it says that the children of Israel or those elders, uh, when they had went over into the promised land, they brought back an evil report. They, God had already told them what the deal was and what to speak and what was going to happen, and they chose to speak something else. This is how important it is for us, even if you get a pain in your body, to speak the word over your body. This is how important it is when you have a circumstance or situation that goes on to speak what God's word says about it. If, if you don't know what his word says, just zip it for a moment, okay? Go get in the scriptures. Go, go uh, say, hey, uh, apostle, I'm dealing with this. What, what, can I, what can I pray? What can I speak over this, all right? If you don't know. But there, there are all kinds of things that we, access that we have to the word to be able to, um, you know, we have resources available for us to do that. To, uh, so it's so important that we understand the authority that God has given us as kings and priests. Your words matter. What you speak matters. In the days to come, to, to overcome the adversity that we will experience on the earth, as I told you guys before, you know, you know what are you going to do when something else occurs if you put your faith only in a vaccine or something else, or, or something else, it could be anything else. If you only put your faith in those things, okay, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do when something else comes on the scene? You know, and you got, I don't have to go through or rehearse all of the, the reports, okay, of the variant and all of those things. So what, what, what will you do, okay, you know? And I'm not telling you to get the vaccine or not. I'm not telling you publicly to do that, okay? But what I am saying is this, regardless of everything, trust God. Speak what God says about your life, okay? Psalm 91, your life, okay? All right? See, we have to access a greater dimension, okay? When I say dimension, I'm not talking about something, you know, Spooky, alien, it's, you know, science, science is already proven, just in case you're not up to speed. Science has already proven that there are multiple dimensions outside of this dimension that you and I live in, okay? So I'm not telling you something that's not scientifically known, all right? So I believe that there is a, a, a dimension of reality for every um, Aleph bet that has been that God has spoken, okay? So I'll get into that another day, maybe. I'll let uh, Pastor John tell you about that. But, uh, but, you know, there are greater things that God wants us to access and he's given us to access. Jesus established a pattern and, and he is our high priest. As we say when we pray over our offerings and we see throughout the word of God in Hebrews, it talks about it. He is our high priest and we are priests in his kingdom. And so we work with our high priest so that God's will will be done on the earth 
so that what is established, and this is why even as priests we work with the offices that are in the church, the governmental offices in the church, so that when we need to pray, guess what? We're, we, we go in faith knowing that God will do what he said and that we have a place that we can access. See, the, the place that we access is not reserved just for the offices, the governmental offices in the church. God has preserved that and made it available for every single person. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are or where you come from. If you're blood bought and washed, God has given us access. And so I encourage you guys to go back and uh, review these scriptures that um, have been covered today. And there are so many others that I didn't get into. But please understand that you are royalty. <laughs> As one movie line says, you are royalty for God's sake. All right. So you are royal. You are a royal priesthood. God has preserved you to be holy. Set you apart so that you will be holy. Not just us preachers, okay, but every person in here that is born again. And God wants you to use your priesthood to access his power and greater realities um, in your life. Amen. Well, let's stop right here. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Will somebody give God a shout of praise right now? The priesthood is all over the Bible in every, all different aspects of different things. You just have to read and dig. But it's great significance when you understand how it connects you to the power of God to change things. We cannot change things that are in our world by natural means. There are things that you can do that God, you know, there are natural things that we can do in certain situations and things, but for the lasting and ultimate change, you have to access a greater dimension. See, the sooner that you understand that all of the turmoil and things that are going on in the world around us come from the other or the dark, the dark side of the spiritual aspect of things, the kingdom of darkness, as we call it. And the only way that you can overcome those things that are on the earth is by exercising a greater authority. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear son, as the Bible says in Ephesians, is far greater than anything that is in the kingdom of darkness far greater. And when you understand that everything that goes on in our natural world has come or was birthed first in the spiritual realm, you'll understand the importance of going before God in prayer, prayer like never before. Yes, the word of God warns us about the last of the last days. And I'm telling you, if you're not awake, you better wake up. Because we are living in the last of the last days. And you have to understand the urgency of the times that we are on the earth because the enemy also, he already knows that his time is very short. And so even though we are on the earth and, and certain things have been prophesied that are going to take place on the earth, but guess what? While we are still here, okay, while we are still here, we have to still walk in kingdom authority and dominion. Even Jesus, while he was on the earth and the Roman occupation was going on, he still healed the sick. He still raised the dead. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Many got saved. Many had many miraculous things take place in their lives. He cast out devils. He fulfilled God's purpose during his days on the earth. The things that were written about him previously, he fulfilled them all. Well, guess what? You and I live in a time that God prepared us for this generation. Not to just tuck it in and say, oh, well, these are the last of the last days, and I'm just going to look for Jesus to come back. 
And we should be looking for him to come back because we sh that's what the Bible says. We should be looking, okay? And we should be living in such a manner that he could come back at any moment and I want to make sure that I please my Lord. That I'm living in such a way that I honor him and that there's no question that, you know, I'm, I'm going back with him. And while we are on the earth, we should be doing everything that we can. The Bible says that we are ambassadors. So what we, we have the responsibility as priests that when we see men and women, boys and girls that aren't living their lives for the Lord, we have a responsibility. This is our responsibility, okay? To share Jesus with them, to cause reconciliation to take place in their lives where they are brought to God and we introduce God to them. We, we bring it, we bridge the gap that is there in their life. And, and God... God is not going to come from heaven, okay? But God has put us here in the earth. Those that you work with, those that you go to school with, those that you, you, you go to cookouts with, <laughs> all of them. Those that you play sports with, God has made us responsible, okay? So I hope you understand that we are responsible for the world and the lives that are around us. And we should not just turn a blind eye. Even there are people that I don't have direct access to witness to, but I hear people, and I, but I have access to the throne to pray for people. Now, if they're in my presence and I have access to talk to them, then guess what? God doesn't expect me to just say, well, I pray that you, Lord, send somebody across their path. Because guess what? God has said, um, what's up with you? So sometimes we like to put the responsibility <laughs> on someone else to get someone saved. And so God holds us accountable and responsible. So I'm saying this so that we can all, while we are still on the earth, while we are still here in these last of the last days, that we all do our part. In these days of the church, it is very important for us to access a greater level of the power of God in our lives and in the church so that we can see God do even greater things. This is how we're going to access greater dimensions of provision and prosperity in the church. It's, you, some of you just waiting for the 15th of the month for that stimulus check to come or for that child tax credit, and all of those things. We should have our trust in the resources of, of heaven. We should put our trust in speaking and seeing what God says about. God has preserved, and this is what you got to understand. Now, all of those things are coming because, you know, various reasons, but God is restoring provision in the church in these days. And you and I, in order to, he's, I will say this, he's redeeming the time. Don't you know that if you have more money, you can do more quicker? If you have more money, you can do things faster that might take you years to do. You can do things in months or, you know, in a year that might take you 10 years to do. You understand? Think about this. You ever pass by, you ever gone to the store from your house and you pass by somebody that was walking or riding on a bicycle, you're in your car and you pass by them and you went to your destination and then you came back and you passed by them again and they're still heading towards theirs. So that's the difference in resources. Their resources causes them to get to their destination much longer, much more effort, <laughs> Sweating, hiding in the sun, fighting off bugs, might have swallowed a gnat, you know. And then you driving up and down the road in your AC, you've been to your place, 
and you're back, and you're like, man, I'm glad I'm not them. <laughs> but guess what? This is how it is in the resources. And God wants us to access greater resources. Instead of you dollar billing it every day <laughs> in, your, you know, in your amount of resources, God wants to take us to a greater place. Trusting him for our, the areas of health and well-being in our lives. So many people are dealing with so many psychological things because of the pressures that are coming on the earth right now. These are oppressions coming from the outside, spirits that are influencing men. And you got to know. So God has called us to be lights, not hidden under a bushel, but to light in the darkness because the darkness is in the world. And God wants us to operate from that place. That when we speak, we're speaking from the place of fire. That when we talk, that our words are not falling to the ground. So I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me right now. Father, it is in the name of Jesus.